So it's a huge myth that most hospitals are making lots of money. It's a huge myth. And if somebody's looking at their overall margin and they see maybe they're in the positive, but if they look deeper, so now they have investments, fundraising, other revenue sources, and they say, look, they're making just a ton of money. The reality is just like you and I, we have to make a margin in our operations. That should be the goal. And great fundraising and all those other things like investments are security, capital, just all other reasons why you would want that. But the goal is to have a positive operating margin from operations. That's key. Welcome to the Healthcare Leadership Experience, a place where healthcare leaders will share proven strategies and innovative approaches to leading the clinical and business side of healthcare. This show is sponsored by Vi Healthcare Consulting, who has proudly helped hospitals save over $700 million in non-labor costs since 1999. Here's your host, Lisa Miller, founder and CEO of Vi Healthcare. Hello, this is Lisa Miller with the Healthcare Leadership Experience, and I'm here again with Lisa Lauder, who's our show's producer. Welcome, Lisa, to a discussion about cost aware for patient care. Looking forward to it. That's great. So there's a lot of misunderstanding, I believe, about hospital costs versus revenue a hospital makes. So over the last 22 years, when I've been working with frontline team members in hospitals and talking about costs, a lot of times I've heard things like, well, it really doesn't matter. You know, we get paid by case or we get paid by a bundle. And I continue to hear these things through today. And, you know, I, I know that hospitals talk about cost savings and margin improvement, but I think there's a big misunderstanding thinking that hospitals make a ton of money. I hear that. Oh, I hear that so much from vendors, but I hear it often. And it got me thinking like, okay, how do we support hospitals in, you know, bringing in together their people and making them have a cost aware culture? And for the goal is for patient care. They're not doing this for any reason. No one's doing this for any other reason other than to support patients, support the physicians and the clinicians and their communities. So we came up with a program called Cost Aware for Patient Care. And we're not going to talk a lot about that program, but talk about the fringe, the you know, why it's so important that we have to give our team, the, the employees at the hospitals, a big vision to see the opportunities, all the opportunities, while giving them an understanding of the marketplace so they can be contributors in their hospital success. So so what does that mean? You know, the marketplace is very complex, right? So we have suppliers, GPOs, manufacturers, distributors. There's just all these different people, organizations that are part of the mix as it relates to costs. And, you know, some costs are, unfortunately, they're in silos. Some costs are, you know, outsourced physician agreements. So the physicians are providing like ED services or anesthesia services. So, you know, there's, there's all this complexity and hospitals really have to be, I don't want to say transparent, but be educational in explaining to people. And frankly, there's some directors and even some leaders who I don't think understand fully the cost equation as it relates to the whole marketplace, right? You know, distributor markups, pharmacy potentially having a, a cost minus structure or all those other things that relates to services. Services are performed then invoice. Well, what does that mean for the organization? You know, who does our auditing of contracts? We don't, you know, what are our internal controls or what does the marketplace do? What's going to happen in 2022? So this idea of education and pushing out education into their organization about, at least on the cost side, is so key. How costs map to reimbursement? Yes, Medicare gives specific DRGs, you know, for inpatient cases, you know, managed care companies, maybe make a little bit more, but these days, maybe not so much. But how does that work? Because you want them again to be contributors in this process for the organization's success. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a program called Cost Aware for Patient Care. And it starts with presentation to leadership first on hospital costs. We have a really great deck and we go through the market and the shifts and, and where those opportunities are and really understanding how really everything starts with a cost. But what does that mean from an item all the way through to billing? 
And it's a great presentation to have at a leadership meeting, you know, because it really starts people thinking in, in ways that they have a different level of understanding so they can make changes or they can seek out new opportunities. Then we work with directors and all employees on presenting that cost aware presentation. And it's all about educating the organization on costs and giving them insights they otherwise wouldn't. And it's not because anybody's lacking, but it's just being able to put this in a framework that gives them the education. And once someone's educated, I mean, they're never going to go back. They're going to see things differently in that light from then on. So we've had some great success with making those presentations because it's the entry point to better discussions, better thinking. And, you know, there's seven skills and there's probably more, but, you know, for the purpose of this show today, I think those are the seven skills you need for margin improvement. Absolutely. Before you dive into those seven talking points, I, I have a couple of questions for you. The first question that I have for you is in the years that you have been doing this, which I know since 1999, so you've been in this game a long time, what percentage of hospitals do you see making a lot of money versus hospitals that are losing a lot of money because they're not being charged appropriately? It's a really great question. So I'm going to answer it in two ways. One is I'm doing some research now for a report, like an executive report, which may turn into a little skinny book. I'm not sure, but it's analyzing hospitals who have a billion dollars in net patient revenue. And I wanted just to understand, you know, from their Medicare cost report, are there any uniquenesses or anything I could see? So these, I think they're about, we'll say 300 hospitals or health systems that make over a billion dollars, a billion dollars or more in net patient revenue. So that's a very unique subspecialty, you know, in the marketplace. And I wanted to see if they did some things differently. So what I found, and I don't have it right in front of me, but was interesting. It was three buckets, right? So there's high performers, you know, the average, and then kind of lower performers. But I would say out of the 300, I believe there were only like 114 that out of operations, not from any other income. So out of operations were in a positive and that positive, you know, they had some that were higher, but there are some that were just squeaked in at like 0.01%. And then, you know, you have the um, middle tier and the low tier. So it was fascinating. And I still am going through the data because I want to point out that a lot of these, even in the, in the billion dollar club, we'll call it, a lot of them, most of them, I would say probably 70 to 80%. And I think this goes to the marketplace from their operations are operating in a negative operating margin. And they make it up in other ways, fundraising or other outside investments or even outside ventures. So it's a huge myth that most hospitals are making lots of money. It's a huge myth. And if somebody's looking at their overall margin and they see, you know, maybe they're in the positive, but if they look deeper, so now they have investments, fundraising, other revenue sources, and they say, look, they're making just a ton of money. The reality is just like you and I, we have to make a margin in our operations. That should be the goal. And great fundraising and all those other things like investments are, you know, security, capital. I mean, it's just all other reasons why you would want that. But the goal is to have a positive operating margin from operations, right? Operation margin. And that's key. It really is a myth. And then my second question, you talked about your cost aware for patient care program and how it starts with a presentation to leadership. Do you do a presentation to leadership before they actually engage your services for the program? Or is that presentation part of the program? And then my follow-up question to that is, how does a hospital know when they should engage you for a conversation about this? Like, what would be some of the things, if I'm listening to the show right now, going, oh, that cost-aware program sounds interesting. Like, what would qualify me to reach out to you and say, can you tell me more about that? What would I be thinking about? So this program was created like outside of our typical services or typical services supporting hospitals in their cost savings goals, initiatives, analytics, you know, just all kinds of cost projects, right? And so this was kind of created outside of that because Years ago, I had seen a, a presentation from a company that came in and talked about the marketplace from the revenue side. And 
I thought it was a really great presentation and we love growth. You know, everybody loves growth, innovation, new markets. And, and really that was the, what the presentation was about. And it's super exciting. And in my back of my head, I thought, well, we need that same version of that for costs, right? And, you know, it doesn't make sense to grow. I mean, growth is important. Expansion is important. All those things are strategic. But if you're growing a service line that has a negative margin or a minimum margin or not capturing all those opportunities for that new growth, it seems like that's misplaced a little bit, right? It doesn't seem like it's as useful as it could be. It's optimization versus innovation. Both are important, but I would rather have my spend optimized before I decide to grow, 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 be growing a negative problem. So this program is is meant to be added as let's say, you know, we we now do it virtually, but is meant to add as a part of, you know, could be a monthly leadership meeting they have. And we, you know, it's about uh, 90 minutes and it is, you know, we've got a great deck and information and we make it also somewhat interactive. So it's separate, right? It's a pure education. It's meant for educational purposes. And so someone would know that they needed that, I believe, they see their cost increasing or they're feeling like there's not a lot of opportunities or they're feeling like there's maybe not a lot of support or they they just want to rally the team. They, they want to have a great kind of team meeting. And this is a great way to make it educational. So I think that's the first part of your question versus an organization that might bring us in for a cost savings initiative. And I think it's around a couple of things. I think if you're seeing some of those budget areas increasing, if they have a big contract coming up and they, they want to hit it out of the park, right? We come in, we work together, but if they've got a big contract coming up, whether that's on the cost side or even as we support data analytics on the managed care side, if they just if they want someone to come in to analyze the data, benchmark, give them a strategy and provide negotiation services. Sometimes we have hospitals that, you know, they're, they're, I give them a lot of credit. They just want us to help with negotiation. They want us to be there with them behind the scenes, together with them. And some of the Biggest organizations have hire in, in, in business, they hire a negotiation team because you want a team of people. If you're, you're negotiating a multi million dollar contract, some of these contracts are eight figures over the course of years. And, and if a hospital has a plan for the future and they really want to gear up and they, you know, they kind of want to look at their costs now, to maybe be part of that funding, it, it's another great opportunity. And I think second opinions really matter. We talk about it in our next episode, you know, reasons why. Thank you for asking that question. So if someone is interested in that presentation that you do to leadership on hospital costs, should they just contact you directly? Yes, 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 yes. Awesome. We're, we're going to be talking about it more in the marketplace and social media and it's kind of been a little bit under the radar to our current clients and we've written about it a little bit, but we've gotten great feedback. But it's a great way to rally around a topic and for everyone to be aligned. And I, the, I think the subject that keeps on coming up for us of the topic, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, Lisa. It's a great point. I, I'm, my, my thinking's been shifted. And that's the nice part about it because the giving education from, in some cases, we pull information from JAMA, from studies, and we're giving a lot of factual, deep research, right? This isn't like Lisa Miller coming out and, putting together a framework and we do have a framework, but it's built on tremendous research and we pull it together and, you know, they really enjoy it and it, it does become a shift in the way they think. So hence, you know, why we're talking about cost aware for patient care, because this is all about patient care. You know, just because you're looking for cost savings doesn't mean it has to impact patient care. In fact, it's the opposite these initiatives are meant to increase the quality of care, increase services, expand services. So as we look at these seven skills you'll need for margin improvement, number one is open communication. It's the ability not to have um, an employee suggestion system, right? An idea, you know, where people write down ideas, which is great. I, you know, I, I think those things are, are good, but it's linear, it's flat, it's typically one way. But when you have an open communication, you know, that's the ability for somebody who's working to clean the rooms to be able to feel confident enough to say, I have an idea 
could I reach out to someone from finance? Because I, I want to understand how I can put this together. I mean, how comfortable is the organization with somebody who'll be cleaning their rooms to reach out to finance and maybe their department director not getting upset because they did that or afraid of what they'll look like because they didn't bring it up? Who, who knows? Do we have the ability to really have everyone engaging? Everyone is on the uh, same, same value. I love that show, Undercover Boss. So on my list of things to do is to write more about this undercover boss and, and the parallels or the opportunities for hospitals. So wouldn't it be amazing if a hospital CFO or CEO went undercover and worked in food services or EVS? I've seen where they've kind of a little bit where a CEO might do a job for an afternoon, because I've seen some of it on social media, which is really cool because I think that the CEO even is putting themselves in that place to, you know, clean a room, to serve food or to do transport is awesome. But what if they did it that they were completely undercover, right? The CEO said, I want to do transport services for the day. I want to understand because transport will allow them to see really the whole hospital, but do it undercover. What would happen? Like, what would they hear and see? What would they talk about? Like, what would those transport professionals or employees say about their leaders, leadership opportunities? I would love to see some of the leadership kind of do an undercover boss in healthcare and see so it would happen. That would be really cool. I bet they would learn a lot. Yeah, they would learn a lot because the idea is that they are seeing things on the front lines, but they're talking to frontline people that don't know who they are. And they're doing it in such a way that they are going to garner just amazing insights and opportunities and hear, like, do we have an open communication? What's going on there? So there's just a lot of cool ways that you could have open communication, but that's number one. Number two is the idea around observation. So observation is really important. You know, two people can be sitting at the same location and, and observe two different things, right? And so you almost want to be aware of what you're observing. There's an exercise that I've done. It's actually a video I'm in one of Tony Robbins' business mastery programs where he tells everybody, he has puts a video up and there's two different teams and he tells them, okay, count how many times the balls pass from the people in the white shirts to the yellow shirts. So everyone's counting the, how many times it's passed. And so everybody's like four, seven, 18, 15, you know, whatever the number. And, and there is a number. And he does it again, but what people miss is there's a gorilla that walks through the people passing the ball. And most people miss the gorilla. And he stops. He goes, who saw the gorilla? Like there's a, literally a, gr a gorilla costume, someone in a gorilla costume walking through and people miss it. <laughs> it's I've seen that video. It's crazy that you actually are so focused on one thing that you miss the bigger picture. That's such a great metaphor for why we need to be keen in terms of our observations. Yeah. I mean, so like, you know, I was putting this together. I'm like observation. They're going to be like, okay, Lisa, really? So one of the skills you need is observation. Like that's how you begin. And it's yes, because of that gorilla costume story. <laughs> and they have another video, which is really fascinating. And if anyone's interested, I could kind of point you to where it is, where there's two people doing this, like, you know, magic tricks with the cards, but what they, they're watching it, but what they don't realize they like the people take off their jackets, the backgrounds change and all the things they do. And you don't see it to the second video and they were seeing them change their shirt or take their one top off. And now they went from a black shirt to a white shirt. The scenery changes. And it's true, like observation is so important. And, you know, the reality is you can train or educate about slowing down to be able to observe, be aware, look for opportunity. So that's the second. Isn't it a Wayne Dyer quote that when you change the things you look at, the things you look at change? Yeah, absolutely. And again, in preparation, I thought it was, to me, it's so important because we have to choose to be conscious and aware. And, you know, I think you're going to get a different, like you said, different outcome, different reality. So now that we, you know, talked about those two, maybe softer ones, which I think are very powerful. That's why I listed them as one and two. We'll go into some things that people probably have heard of more frequently. And the third is data analysis. And I talk about it a lot because data analysis impacts hospitals everywhere. It impacts the way we analyze 
outcomes from discharge to readmissions to social determinants of health to managed care to cost. There are probably a hundred plus different ways that data analytics could be used for healthcare performance. And a hospital really should be having a list of all the things that they are utilizing data analytics for on a regular basis for their outcomes. And I think it's underused or it's used spotty or it's a lot of assumptions, you know, that are unfortunately being made like, oh yeah, we're doing that. We're analyzing our clinical cost and maybe some things are redone or maybe the OR does it sometime. OR data analytics is key to the overall financial success of a hospital. So how are you using data analysis? And it's not the platforms, it's the analysis. What are you getting out of that analytics? In fact, there's probably a lot of, platforms you're not using, you should get rid of, you know, and really size down and use tools, you know, that may be agnostic like Power BI and pulling in data into a platform like that and and really analyzing your data. Can you give give us an example of a, a data analysis that you did for a hospital that was shocking to them? Yeah. So I think that the one that comes to mind is It's, um, there's a lot, but there's one that I think might be useful for everyone. I think, you know, in terms of orthopedics and implant spend, you know, there's been a lot of focus around uh, capitating, let's say a total knee implant. So capitation means that, you know, there's one price for all the implants for knee replacement. So you go in and need a new knee replacement. This is a big part of the hospital cost. So they'll capitate it. They'll say, you know, let's say for a, a high-performing knee, and I'm just, this is arbitrary, it's uh, $3,000, right? High-performing knee, it's $3,000. We're going to capitate that rate. That's all-inclusive, all-in. And everyone's like, high five, and we got the best rate. There's Nobody's gotten better rates than us. You know what? Uh, we're awesome. And it's great. You know, $3,000, high-performing knee, everyone's happy, best in class plus. So then over time, the vendors start, you know, changing things and bringing in a different component into the capitation, right? And so everyone assumes that component's part of the capitation. So they're just using the component or that there's been some sort of price adjustment because maybe they've used a revision component, you know, a different component because the patient maybe has issues with their bone or weight or whatever. And that's being the adjustments being made. So we recently had a hospital who really, they did a fantastic job at their knee implant capitated cost. But what had happened was that the vendor was bringing in a new component and that component was not included in the capitation, adding $1,400 to the case. And the hospital wasn't aware of it, you know, because they didn't back out the one component, we argued they should get a credit, which they ended up did getting a credit. And so, you know, I would say, uh, let's say, call it $700,000 spend. And they had a nice job with the capitation. And you're looking at a more than 30% cost savings and a credit, we'll call it like a close to $100,000 in credit. And for an organization that, um, again, running in, in a negative operating margin, thought that everything was taken care of. In fact, they were like, you don't need to look here. We just did this. It's fine. You know, we have capitation and we're like, well, it doesn't cost us anything to look at it. Let's just take 12 months of data and let's just run the analysis. And they were shocked. They were completely shocked. And I'll give you one more story on that same note. We had a physician who we were doing the same. This is a large health system and we were getting all the physicians aligned with capitation and we started talking about revision components, a component that costs more and how he's using, he's like, I only use this like seven or 8% of the time. It's all I use it, very specific cases. And we said, well, actually the data shows that you're using it over 37% of the time. You're using this revision company. He said, what? He's like, I, he had no idea. Data showed something completely different than what he thought he was doing and thinking he needed. He's like, that's way too much. Yeah, we assume when we don't have data to support our assumptions, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I feel like sometimes the assumption is so strong, like, you know, no, no, we, you know what, I, we're not doing that. I'm only doing that little bit. No, no, we got that covered. And it's pretty interesting to see not just a little bit of variance. Sometimes it's just a huge variance into the, some of the assumptions that are made. And I think that's the biggest opportunity is I often say to my team, sometimes the hospitals, 
you can take the emotion out of all this work because the data speaks to the facts, you know? So I don't have to get, how should I say it, worried about what a physician might say or someone might say, or be offended that the contract was just done and there's still opportunity. I mean, the data is going to speak for itself. And, you know, you, all you can do is you present the data, show the opportunities, but um, we need to use data a lot more and a less on gut, a less on reactionary, a less on assumptions, because I think that's an important skill. So negotiations, it's such an interesting area because I feel like that's a big untapped opportunity for hospitals. So I want to take a step back. Hospitals, your vendors get trained in negotiations probably once or twice a year. In fact, if you were to Google vendor negotiation or manufacturer negotiation, there are companies that all they do is provide negotiation services for vendors to help them increase their margin. I have those resources. I've been on their site. I've, in fact, I've been on some of the trainings. I don't say this to be mean-spirited, or I, I say this hopefully to awaken and, and alert people, but hospitals are being out-negotiated every single day by their vendors. And it is, to me, one of the biggest opportunities that hospitals need for margin improvement. Negotiation is you have entry level, mid level, advanced. You have people who have been negotiating for the FBI. There's a great book, I Never Split the Difference. I encourage everyone to read it. Once any of my customers tell me, Lisa, just to split the difference will be good, I, I cringe. I'll do whatever they want, but I'll explain why that's not a good idea. And it's not that you want them, anyone else to lose, it's just, it's just not a great strategy. So negotiations require you to have such a solid base of your agreement, you know, pricing or whatever you're negotiating. It could be managed care, it could be negotiating with physicians, but for you to have a solid platform to know what are the things that are important, what are those drivers, and then to have a strategy to understand that you probably need a team. You probably need one or two people, but you at least need a negotiation buddy. I mean, if you want to be in a high-performing situation, don't ever do this alone. And if you, if you feel like you could do it alone, you're not going to get the best outcome. It's I mean, amazing how people are afraid to negotiate. They're afraid to ask for a better deal. They're afraid, to, like, I don't know what it is that makes us human beings uncomfortable when it comes to the actual skill of negotiation. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's two things. You have some people, and I think it's the lesser that just feel that they're just great negotiators. They just feel like they can do it all on their own. They don't need anything and they can just negotiate. And But the vast majority of people do not like to negotiate and they're not always truthful about it. They're uncomfortable. Vendors are, again, are really skilled. They're doing things like they'll circumvent situations, circumvent to the doctors, to, to a higher authority. They make it very uncomfortable or they'll they have strategies like, oh, we're losing money. This isn't fair. This doesn't exist. I mean, they deploy a lot of strategies and it works. And to your point, I don't know what it is, but just the simple ask. I think we, we do a negotiation training program. And one of the first things we talk about is the biggest problem is that people just don't even want to ask. <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as that. It's like up there on the list. Yeah. People are too attached to the outcome. They take it personally if they ask and they don't get what they ask for. And so then they avoid it because the first time they did it, they weren't successful. It's true. There's a, there's a lot of psychology around negotiations and just asking and being okay, being okay with getting rejection or being okay with maybe you get the rejection the first one or two times. I can't tell you how many times that we get no the first time. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to show you. Like we just didn't pull this scenario number out of thin air. And we're willing to keep this going and back it up and continue because you get no does not mean failure in negotiations. That's why having a strategy is so important. But it's a great point, Lisa, about us being uncomfortable with asking. So negotiation training. I have mentioned this before, but there's a study that was done. It was in businesses, I believe it was like the Fortune 1000. And those companies that have a systematic negotiation process versus those who don't, the difference in profitability, I believe it was almost like 14%. So negotiation has a direct correlation with profitability. If you think about all the contracts your hospital has, whether it's on the cost side, expense, I'm sorry, the reimbursement side, 
whether it's with a JV agreement, anything that any contract you have, negotiation can be tied to the profitability or a financial outcome. So the better you become at negotiations and the better you're willing to sometimes slow down, have a plan, want a negotiation strategy, the better your rewards are. Number five, it's decision-making, critical thinking, and what Keith Cunningham calls thinking time. So it's kind of a combination, but we have to be able to really push back on our even our own decisions. So if we have a decision we've made, let's say on a contract or a decision on a strategy where we want to go to or present, how willing are you to say, is this the right decision? What if this is wrong? What don't I see? What's the downside risk? How are you able to really question your own decision-making? And, you know, what's that process like? And, and taking some thinking time, you know, it's taking 20 minutes, a pen, paper, and writing down all those outcomes. And am I making the right decision? Are there other decisions I'm, I'm not thinking about? Is there an and, something I can add to this decision? But we think that quick decisions are great decisions. And in fact, it's when you really become aware and question your own decisions, then you become a better decision maker. So true. So powerful. And we live in such a multitasking, distracted time that it is unusual for people to sit and think about their decisions and think about what they might be missing. Yes. And it'd be interesting what you end up coming with just by having that time and making a list and it's just like, and, 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 and what may end up being a, you know, a correlation or a combination, you know, something different that you might come up with. And so number six is project management. This is a skill being able to plan a project with milestones, put something together. It could be one or two pages. We use a system called Workfront. We love Workfront. We create our milestones. I can tell you, we have seven milestones to every project we do. By the time we get to milestone five, I can tell you that that project will complete in X number of days. We have it pretty well mapped out. And you don't have to do that to that level. You know, We're managing so many projects per hospital and outcomes are important. So we want to drive to or towards rapid outcomes. So we have deployed a system that manages days. Our projects most projects should take 30 days. And that's another thing, you know, it's funny because when we tell a hospital, we tell a vendor, or even some people within the hospital, this happens even recently, we're going to finish this in 30 days. They're like, that's impossible. You're, what you're doing is impossible. That, that can't be. And I'm like, well, no, we can do it in 30 days. And I'm like, what if, so what if we can't, but we've told the vendor, this is what we want better than what it takes six months. Why do we accept the vendor's timeline. Why do we accept long timelines? Well, that's not a badge of honor to say this project took nine months. It's way more powerful to get this incredible outcome than Mary right, set it for 30, 45, 60 days. But having a project management system in place is really important. Too many people, again, are just, you know, they're running by the urgent issue of the day and then they get to a margin improvement opportunity. That could be a whole other podcast just on yeah. project management. Cause you know, I'm, I'm sitting here listening and I, I want to know what are the seven milestones? Do you have a system <laughs> around this? How do you do like, because on my team, my right hand always says to me, process equals profits. And so when you look at processes that are integrated into your project management systems, then it does equal margin improvement opportunities inside of hospitals. It's the same thing. So I think that would be a great episode to unpack further. I love that. And I think one on negotiation as well, but project management, yes, it took us years to get our process down for project management. And I have to thank Hector Rodriguez, who really doubled down and made us really focus and took that initiative. We had a very, we had a good process. And he wanted it to be great and he made it great. And I give him the credit for that. It has been probably one of the leading reasons for our success, having this project management system in place. So I am going to take you up on that. We'll do a podcast on project management. And then to wrap up number seven is monitoring and measuring. So we've done all this work, right? So we have open communication we have observation, data analysis, negotiation, thinking time, project management. We do all this work 
right? We've lined up these six major components and areas that require like a lot of muscle, right? And then project's done, put it away, put it in the drawer, put the contract somewhere, it's done, or the project away. We Look, we got the savings, we got the revenue, we got the engagement, and it's done. And then nobody measures and monitors. <laughs> so- or they measure a monitor at the end when it's too late to impact change. Well, they measure a monitor right before the renegotiation. They go, oh, wait a minute. This is what happened in month eight. And that's exactly what happens is they're ready to re-up that agreement or the analysis or the area, then, then that's done. So you do all this work. Like how much work is spent on getting ideas, getting them in place, getting them approved, getting alignment, negotiating internal, external data, project management, all that work's done. And then we don't measure and monitor. <laughs> I'm, I speak about measuring, monitoring so much and funny, and I don't want to bring GPOs back into this conversation, but I am for the moment, you know, everyone's like, get on the contract. Let's get on the contract. You want to be on our contract. And okay. But Who's talking about the discipline of measuring and monitoring to say, hey, look, something's off there, month six. I can't tell you how many times, you know, we work with our clients and we finish a project and then we put in place measuring and monitoring. I mean, not every agreement because maybe they're smaller and some things can be done, you know, possibly, you know, ad hoc. I, I think every agreement or every cost should be analyzed, but, you know, we'll come in and, you know, start that month one, we're like, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not right. And we capture it month one, or we just see things in month seven, like, and we capture them in real time. And you think about it's, it's not cost avoidance because that would have been a real cost, but we're capturing issues as they're happening. And we're protecting all the hard work everyone did. We're protecting those cost savings. Lisa, you know, you and I talk about cost protection and then it gives you the opportunity to dig even deeper. If you've got everything you're doing in place, you're measuring and monitoring, and now you get to see other nuances that take your savings even further because you've done all this work, you've measured and monitored, and now you're going to take this to a new level, a deeper thinking, a deeper analysis. I think people, or maybe you can answer this question. I think people lose sight of the impact on the patient care, the patient experience. They look at these skills in isolation of the impact to patient care. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. You know, we do talk about it, the business side of healthcare, but the, the reality is this is about patient care, right? So the measuring, the monitoring, okay, it's probably another thing somebody has to do, but it is about patient care. It is about the margin. And maybe measuring and monitoring should be one department, I, and I'm certainly not suggesting that you're adding all these different people, but maybe it is an outsource function, measure and monitoring. Maybe the top 20 agreements need a completely different approach to measure and monitor and provide the insights going in. I'm telling you, it, it is remarkable what we see when we are measuring and monitoring for our clients. The things that we're capturing, the that would have been a big financial blunder had we not caught that you know, when you did Lisa. So I, you know, it, it's true. It, all those things would have a patient impact. And I think that's the problem. We've got to keep on tying those things to patient care, Lisa. You're absolutely right. So as we wrap up, this was a great discussion. I'm very passionate about, you know, when we talk about things that can support patient care and I love the episodes, episode number five with JJ Peterson on the patient is the hero of the story. I encourage everyone to listen. Next week's episode is why engage a healthcare consulting firm for margin improvement. There's four reasons why you'd want to do that. You want to do it as a second opinion. I've got some great second opinion stories for everyone. Expertise to accelerate margin improvement. The accountability word, which is so important. Actually, I was writing something and titling it, the deadline made me do it, <laughs> you know? I love so, that. Yeah. And an unbiased opinion, an unbiased review. So that's what we're going to talk about next episode. If you enjoy the show, I encourage you to please send it to someone you might be thinking you would be interested. If you'd like to get it in touch with me about the Cost Aware for Patient Care program, I'd love to talk with you further. Thank you, Lisa. And we will continue the show. Have Thanks a great for day. having me here. It was great. Thank you. Hi, this is Leah. You are listening to my mom's podcast, The Healthcare Leadership Experience. 
Hi, this is Fernando. He likes to speak with my mom's email. Her.